so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. As a librarian, I often get asked the question, are libraries still relevant in the digital age? After all, everything's available online through the open internet. It's free and it's so easy to find. Certainly, the internet and electronic access to information has revolutionized the way we acquire knowledge. But there are many aspects of the library that contribute to society, so I'm here this morning in a few minutes to provide you with an overview of some of the current trends in libraries, to pose some questions about the future, which is not just about books. And I hope in a subtle way to convince you that indeed libraries are still very relevant in the digital <coughs> age. However, before I get started, I have to say when Kathleen asked me to speak, I was pretty impressed with the early time frame. Now I can already tell that you're wide awake, but I thought it might be fun to check in and see if you are really awake with a little library trivia. So, what is the world's largest library? Any takers there? Library of Congress? Yay! Oh, wow. Good job, Sandy. We can take this back to Sandy. So call us Library Swag. Good job. That's cool. Very impressed. Now this next question should be a no-brainer. Which is greater, the number of books, the number of McDonald's, or the number of public libraries? I don't have enough Collins bags to give everyone. But <laughs> the good news is that public libraries are indeed prevalent. So on to the more serious information. This is a view from the past, and times have certainly changed. This is a great photo that we have hanging in the Collins Memorial Library on the campus of University of Puget Sound. It's from our very first campus and shows a time when books were definitely the go-to resource. This picture hangs in the library to remind students of the past, and it also gives me time to pause and reflect about my own personal career path. I started to think about my very first professional position. I was an art history slide librarian. I was responsible for the creation of 35 millimeter slides to support art history classes at Indiana University. This involved locating the right image in a book or exhibition catalog, photographing it, mounting it in special metal and glass binders to protect them, and then cataloging the slides. Well, those slides have now been replaced by scanned digital image collections. The 40,000 35 millimeter slides I made and cataloged just in a span of 25 years are all gone and replaced in digital format and in some cases, replaced by online commercial resources. For example, at the University of Puget Sound, we no longer have a slide collection, but we subscribe to something called Art Store, which provides access to over one million images representing all aspects of art and cultural history. And more and more of these collections are becoming online. Just this week, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York released over 400,000 high quality images to the general public available through the internet. So I started to think a little bit about other disappearing formats, and here are some pictures of formats that have changed just in the last two decades. Gone are CDs, audio tapes, 8-track tapes, and while it hasn't disappeared, I love this picture of Michael Douglas in Wall Street, Every time I look at this picture of him holding what was then, at the time, the most up-to-date technology, that big mobile phone, I have to chuckle. So how does this changing landscape affect libraries, and what types of questions do I, as a library director in the profession, have to address? Building on a report issued by the Pew Research Center on the future of libraries, I'd like to address these three questions the future of knowledge, the pathways to knowledge, and the future of library spaces. I've already touched upon the revolution in technology, but of course one of the most profound changes is the move from print to digital format. Not only have 35 millimeter slides disappeared, but a lot of newspapers have disappeared. Books are changing, and journals are now available electronically. 
So what does this mean for the public library and the academic library? Well, I really feel strongly, and I'm happy to say that it will still be about books, but perhaps the format of our books will change. Electronic books will continue to evolve and challenge us to work with vendors and publishers to ensure fair and equitable lending policies, and also to ensure that they're easy to use on many different mobile devices. On the academic level, the revolution from print to digital has transformed our access. I don't know how many of you can remember doing library research where you had to pick out an individual index and look out the an article and then go to the stacks. Well, of course, now today's students just have to touch a computer terminal, find a citation, and literally have access to tens of thousands of full-text journals. This change in technology also allows us to rethink what we might be doing with legacy collections, such as those bound journals, older books, and microform. And many libraries are discarding them or working with companies such as Better World Books to ensure that they are placed in a developing country or in a library that doesn't have access, leaving space in our current libraries to redesign for more student learning spaces. The expansion of digital access also provides us with opportunities to explore ways to expose our hidden collections. More and more libraries across the country are really using this technology to expose their rare and unique collections. And on the screen are some images from the University of Puget Sound Rare Book Collection. Uh, one of our projects, we digitized paintings of the Western artist Abby Williams Hill, as well as some of her letters. And I think the exposure of these local, unique resources are really op expanding opportunities for engagement. We're also working with faculty to develop teaching and learning programs, and we do outreach to the community. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had fifth graders from McCarver Elementary visit our rare book room where they had the opportunity to handle a medieval manuscript and also touch a letter that was written by one of the first missionaries to arrive in Washington State. And when I asked the students if they had ever held anything or seen anything that old, one of the students looked at me and said, only, I've only seen something like that in a fairy tale. So to me, this really gave an opportunity for students to handle something special, to be in connection with their history, and to really uh, enrich their educational experience. Other things we're doing at the University of Puget Sound, and certainly the Tacoma Public Library, is also digitizing archival photographs so that you can search for the history of Tacoma, do research online about architectural history. If any of you are loggers, for example, we have scanned our entire student newspaper from the first issue in 1898 to the present day. So these are really great and effective ways to harness technology. Not only is technology change, but the pathways <laughs> to find information. Um, I love this image. It went viral on all the librarians' listservs. Um, gone are those days when the card catalog was the way to discover information. Now our users want material anytime, anywhere, on any device, and they want it easy. But I can tell you that our new generation of students need guidance. Even though our students, even those in middle school, high school, and coming into the college, may be tech savvy and have never known a world without Google, iTunes, and Wikipedia, they really lack critical thinking skills to help them sort through relevant and accurate information on the internet. And that can result in information overload. And I bet if I asked, some of you have already been checking your email. You get kind of that sickness when you, you're away from your mobile phone. You get nervous. But when you think of our email, with Twitter, with Facebook, with Pinterest, with blogs, with texts, it can be pretty overwhelming, as some of the statistics on the screen show you. In fact, the Pew Research Center tells us that 70% of adults say they are overwhelmed by the amount of information available to them. And I know firsthand from working with students that while they love the access to all the information, they can find it quite daunting and simply be overwhelmed with having to sort through it. 
So one of the changing roles of today's librarian is that the librarian is really more of a partner in the educational process, helping to educate users about searching for relevant content. I love this picture because I don't know how many of you feel like this some days, but that's how some of our students feel when they come to us. So we're really there to help them sort through that content in this fast-paced digital world. In addition, a really important point about libraries and the profession of librarianship is that we take our role as advocates for free and equal access to information very seriously. While I'm very privileged to work in a university, I'm keenly aware that there are places, even in our own community and around the world, where internet access is not readily available, where access to reading materials are limited, and where budgets are threatened because of the cost of higher education. In fact, often the school library is one of the first things to be cut when budget decisions have to be made. In a a study issued by the American Library Association on the digital divide, it was reported that one in three people in the United States do not have internet access from their home. Librarians take their role as advocates of access to information seriously because in some cases the public library might be the only single source of internet access as well as information and reading material for a community. This was recently played out this past year when public libraries were asked to step up and help consumers understand the Affordable Care Act. Librarians and libraries served as centers of information to help people sign up for the affordable care and explain the, the complexity of that act. Childhood literacy programs, teen and adult reading efforts are really essential for our informed and educated society. And we really need to protect and advocate for these programs. Finally, our third big question is to look at the future of our spaces. And we really need to think about designing for engagement. We need to think of libraries as active cultural and learning centers, rather as just static repositories of lots of books. Our new libraries need to be designed to promote active learning, be flexible, address new technology, while at the same time still respecting the need for contemplation. And there are some great examples here in Tacoma. The Teen Center at the Downtown Public Library is a great way to bring young people into the library. And if any of you have been to the Pierce College Library in Stellacom, it's really a stellar example of a new, newly renovated library. At the University of Puget Sound, we're removing some of those legacy collections. So when I came five years ago, we had lots and lots of beautiful public spaces filled with documents that were now online from the government. We've removed those documents, expanded the spaces, and made them into exhibit spaces for community engagement. We work closely with local book artists, and I'm just going to put in a plug that on June 5th in the evening, we have our fourth annual members exhibit of the Puget Sound Book Artists. You're all invited. But it's great to bring members of the community into the library and see it more as a holistic cultural center. So in conclusion, a couple of uh, final points about those big questions, ways that libraries are maintaining relevancy. We're forming collaborations. I'm really proud to be part of an Orbis Cascade Alliance where 37 libraries in the Pacific Northwest have banded together to share staff and to share budget. So we're really looking at an efficiency of work and operations. Rather than 37 libraries all doing the same thing 37 times, we're now working together to be more effective in the use of our budgets. Um, we're also preserving materials through the digital realm, which I think is an, a wonderful way to preserve legacy and an effective use of technology to allow those resources to be spread. We're looking at new ways to create um, the Google of the future, so to speak. The card catalog is passe, but we're looking at more discovery ways. Many of the new ways that libraries are doing this is allowing crowdsourcing and tagging of information. I'm sure many of you have borrowed books from Amazon and you have that little note at the bottom. If you like this book, maybe you'll buy this book. And libraries are beginning to be more proactive in allowing the consumer to tag information and share ideas on their online catalogs. We're also looking to be more of a teacher, as I mentioned. So our librarians 
put in 429 classes last year at the University of Puget Sound. That's a huge number of classes, but we're really working with faculty and students to partner so that they can understand the information landscape. And finally, we're looking at moving from just being a static repository to be a, being a knowledge provider. And we're looking at making information accessible that's produced. Some examples at the University of Puget Sound include we are now putting our student publications up online. Um, we have a very active black student union who publish a magazine called Black Ice. We've been able to put that magazine online and now it's fully accessible to the rest of the world, which is really wonderful. One of our new neuroscience faculty created an online journal of student research and we've been able to host that. So we're looking at doing more activities that record and engage and document knowledge. So in conclusion, I just want to end with a few of my favorite graphics about libraries. Um, every fall we try a new campaign to get students into the library and we've already planned our fall campaign. We're going to use Albert Einstein's quote. I mean, this is just, to me, says it all. The only thing you absolutely have to know is the location of the library. And of course, these are great quotes as well and really inspirational. But my favorite quote is one that resides engraved on the wall of the Collins Memorial Library. Although it might be several hundred years old, I still think it resonates today. I hope in these few moments I've given you some food for thought, helped you think about the changes and the importance of libraries. I have put some propaganda literature out on the table. <laughs> I put a brochure of the Collins Memorial Library. As community members, all of you are welcome to visit our library and attend our events. You can Google us and find out what's going on in the library. And I've also put a wallet side guide to American libraries. You can just stick that in your wallet and the next time you have a question or want to advocate for libraries, you can just pull it out and you have the facts right in front of you. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak and I'd be happy to answer any questions.